you want to go ahead and take your Bibles, turn to uh, Luke, Luke chapter 17. That's where we'll be this morning, kind of wrapping up our series that we've been in, looking at God's generosity. Pastor Dave talked about gratitude last week. We'll be doing that again today. Being thankful for what God has done, as we just sang about. Do uh, keep your church family in prayers, hopefully this week. We've had a couple members who've lost loved ones, so we'll be praying for them. And I know many who are gone sick this morning, a lot of families who are not feeling well, so we'll be praying for them as well. I know it's that time of year for that, uh, but do be lifting them up uh, in prayer. As we look at uh, God's generosity, we look at how good He has been to us, what it, what it should result in is us automatically being thankful. Now, we know that this isn't how it always uh, works out. We can, we can struggle with that. Uh, but I, I do want to put our focus on that some this morning. And to get us kind of thinking about that, I, I want, if you would, imagine with me uh, a young lady or a young man, let's say, let's say they're maybe 19 or, or 20, year, 20 years old. All right, and I want you to, to picture them. Uh, let's say they go to a very nice college. They're at a, a good university maybe even a prestigious one. Uh, they, had, they have good parents in their life. Uh, they, they know that they had pretty good parents in life. Their parents helped them a lot along the way, taught them well, taught them morals, helped them financially, uh, which allows them to be uh, where they are currently. Uh, let's say that they were well-trained. They had the opportunity to participate uh, in extracurricular activities, whatever that might have been. And their parents did the best to help them with that. But they were also uh, well-trained in other things. Let's say they, they went to church with their family and so were trained in some, some spiritual things, uh, but also educated uh, very well. Uh, as they sit in their room, they have nice clothes. Their closet is full of the best. Uh, the name brands, things that we would recognize, things that are fashionable even at the time. They have a car. That is right outside their dorm room or their apartment, wherever they are. And it's a decent car. Maybe it's not the best car, but it's, it's a good car and it's reliable. And they have friends uh, who they get together with quite often. They have a good time together at the university. They go to the games. They do different things. They tailgate. They do all this stuff. And so as we look at them, they have really a good life. They seem to have everything. Now, maybe even certain people are coming to your mind as I talk about this. Maybe you know people who are like this. But now imagine this with me, if you would, as well. That young adult sits in their dorm room or in their apartment, wherever they are, and they're miserable. They're miserable. When they look at life, they don't seem to have much hope. They find themselves to be depressed often. They live a life that's very ungrateful. They, they live as if they deserve more, as if things should be happening uh, more often for them or in an easier way, if that would be possible. And when you talk to them, and if you really got down to the brass tacks of it, when you, when you have a conversation with them, they would even say something along the lines as if, it seems as if the world is out to get me at times. Now, when we talk about this scenario, does it anger you at all? You know, if, if you had the opportunity to talk to that person in their 19, their 19, let's say, or, or 20, and this whole thing that I just talked about, if you had the opportunity to talk to them and they looked at you and said, it's as if the world is out to get me, what would you do? Some of you'd smack them, wouldn't you? You'd smack them right across the face. And you'd say, are you kidding me? Look at your life. You've been given Everything. You have good parents, you have parents who love you, you have a family, they've, they've provided for you financially, you have friends, you are smart. Look, at you're at this university and you're doing well here, you have made, you have made friends. What more, what more would you want? Why, why do you find yourself in your life being full of anxiety and, and depressed and why, why are you ungrateful? This shouldn't be this way. Now, while this is frustrating, we know there's people in the world like this, don't we? And maybe we would want to take that person and take them somewhere to show them people 
who maybe had the right to think that way, wouldn't we? It's like, let me show you some people who have it difficult. Uh, Let me show you some people who, if we want to say the world is out to get them, it's these people. Let's, Let's try to walk in their shoes for a little bit. Let's have conversations with them so that you can see uh, what difficulty really does look like. People who have it horrible and who you and I would even say, you have the right to complain. You have the right to be frustrated maybe with how the world is going because you're in a tough spot. See, with this being said, I, I do this on purpose, of course. I think we as Christians oftentimes fall into the category of the young adult that I just talked about. We fall in line with our culture where we start to think that the life that we have isn't the life that we should have, that we are owed something else. And sometimes we'll even portray that and push that on to God. God, I'm a good Christian. God, I go to church regularly. God, I've done my best to raise my kids. I've tried to love my wife. I I try to do the things that are right, but yet when it comes to my job, I never get promoted. Yet, month in and month out, my bills keep coming and I, I always seem to be underwater a little bit with them. Right? We, we can fall into this uh, way of thinking where we are, are frustrated and where we don't understand why our life is the way that it is. And what that leads to is it does lead to depression. It leads to anxiety. It leads to a great amount of frustration. And we have to be careful as the church to not allow this to happen. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it's this chapter where Paul talks about the sin in the world. And it says in in verse 21, it says, For although they knew God, notice, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. One of, the, one of the signs that Paul is talking about here of those who are just turning their backs from God, they're living a life of, of sin, is they know God, they know there's a God, but they don't give any thanks to God. They don't recognize Him. And so as a result, what happens? Their life is darkened. Their ways are, are darkened. And so what are they to give thanks for? What, what, is, what is being talked about here? What is, give God th- give thanks to Him. Thanks for what? Right? What, what is supposed to be our cause of thanksgiving, our, our cause of, of gratitude, our, our cause of, re, of rejoicing? Where does, where does that come from? I think that's the big question that uh, we need to know and we need to answer. Because for a lot of us in here this morning, the truth of the matter is God blesses us continually, all the time. Uh, last week, Pastor Dave preached and he went to Nehemiah and he was in Nehemiah chapter 12. And he walked us through uh, Nehemiah chapter 12. 12, and we saw how God had blessed his people, Israel, even through suffering, even through great trials, right? These, these people left and they, they went and sacrificed to build the wall, and through this sacrifice, it was extremely difficult. It was extremely difficult, yet God still blessed them in the midst of, of this difficulty, of this struggling, and we know that oftentimes God does this. The Bible speaks of that. God uses our suffering for our good to help us grow, right, to help these different things. And, and we know that this is true. But what happens? And this happens also. What happens when we suffer? What happens when we struggle? And at the end of that suffering and at the end of that struggle isn't some material benefit. What happens then? Do we not give thanks anymore? You know, what happens when we go through something uh, that's hard in our life and we think, well, God must have a reason for this, and all of a sudden we realize, I don't know what the reason was. I don't see it. I I don't have anything tangible to, to grasp onto. Now, again, we know that so often in our life, God does give us things that are tangible and that we can grab onto. Dave talked about that last week with how he met Angie, right, in a difficult part of life, and now he has... He has his wife. But what about those people who don't get a wife? What about those people who don't, the child doesn't come? 
Does that mean that they don't give thanks? Does that, does that mean that they have no reason to thank God? They have, they have no reason to gather together with other Christians to, to praise Him and to, re, to rejoice in Him because when they say, uh, my life is difficult, they can't point to something that says it was difficult, but it was worth it because of this. They just don't have that. What are we to praise Him for? What are we to give thanks for? Where is our gratitude directed at all times as Christians, or where should it be directed? Because again, I think it's just reality. Sometimes we find ourselves in positions of great hopelessness. Uh, we find ourselves in spots of just great discouragement in our life. Yet the fact of the matter is, and this is for us as Christians only, not, not, not the outside world, only us. It's during these hopeless times, these discouraging times, when we don't see anything. It's in these times when we are reminded, or at least we should be reminded, and hopefully that's what this morning is, that as believers, we are in Jesus Christ. That's where our thankfulness comes from. Nowhere else. That's where our gratitude is cemented. That is where our hope is found. That is why we gather this morning. We gather this morning, why? Because we are in Christ. We don't gather this morning because we got to spend time with family this week for Thanksgiving. Because the fact is, some of you might not have got to do that. It might not have got to happen for you. Right? We gather this morning because we gather under the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. And today, I want to look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 11 to 19 to help us to see that as Christians... What we have is we always, listen to that, we absolutely always have something to be thankful for. And in fact, it is the greatest thing to be thankful for. There's, there's nothing that can surpass it. There's, there's no joy that is bigger or greater than it. And I think sometimes we get a little lost, though, and forget. And so hopefully this morning is a very simple reminder for you, but also for me as well. So follow along. Luke 17, verse 11 and 19. It says, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. I've always been fascinated by the stories in Scripture of leprosy. And Jesus healing people of leprosy. Uh, leprosy isn't something that is too common today, although it does, it does exist uh, today. But leprosy is a horrible disease. It's a disease that causes sores on the skin. It attacks the, nervous, it, it attacks the actual nerves uh, in the body, which causes those who have leprosy to not even be able to, to feel which is a big problem because those with leprosy then end up usually hurting themselves uh, greatly. Uh, could, could be on fire and they, they don't even know it. They don't even realize it because of all the nerve damage that they have. And then uh, another thing with leprosy is leprosy starts to absorb your appendages. And so as leprosy gets bad enough, that's where you'll see pictures of fingers starting to disappear and toes starting to disappear, the nose starting to disappear. And it's because the body is starting to absorb those things. Leprosy is very contagious. And so it's not something that you want to be around. It's, again, it's not, a, it's not a, a good thing to be a leper. And so, in fact, in, in Bible times, nowadays we have ways to try to help cure it with different medicines. But in the time of Jesus, if you were a leper, you were the definition of hopeless. There was no hope for you. Uh, none at all. In fact, it was so hopeless that God set up safeguards for Israel concerning leprosy in Leviticus. 
And there's pages and pages in Leviticus talking about leprosy and what needs to be done if you wake up with a rash in the morning. That's how serious it was. And so you can go and read and it'll say, if you wake up with a rash, you need to take a bath and then you need to wait so many days and you need to go to the priest and you need to show them this and they're going to decide if it's leprosy or if it's not. It was a big deal. Because if you were found to be a leper, guess what? You're out. You're out because it's too contagious. There were places for you to go, but you had to leave your family. You had to leave your friends, and you had to go, and you had to spend the rest of your life with, guess what? Lepers. With more lepers. That's who you would be with. Lepers lived with lepers. And they were considered untouchable. That was your life. (laughs) It was no fault of your own. It would just be the disease that you have. So now you were seen as untouchable. Nobody wanted to look at you. Nobody wanted to be close to you. And by law, you were required to stay away from everybody. When we read this story here in Luke chapter 17, we come across these 10 men, and they are all lepers. They have leprosy, and they have no hope. It's not odd that they are together, as I said, because this is the only people they could be with. It's the only people that they could be around. And so they're all together, and it seems as if, again, we don't have a ton of information here, but it it seems as if somehow they heard about Jesus, that they had heard about this guy who had been doing some healings, and in fact, he had also healed lepers. And so all of a sudden, what creeps inside of them a little bit is something that maybe they hadn't had in a very long time, and that is hope. Hope. All of a sudden, hope came to them because Jesus is in their town. Now, I don't know how long they had been lepers. I don't know how long this disease had riddled their body. I don't know how bad they looked at this point in time and how much the disease had ravaged them. But no doubt, nonetheless, they were ten miserable men. Very miserable. And so, as Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, he's passing, it says, between Samaria and Galilee. He enters this village where these ten lepers are. And notice it says that they stood at a distance. But as they stood at a distance, what did they do? They they cried out to him. Now, as these men call out to Jesus, it is interesting that they didn't approach Jesus. Because in the other uh, time when Jesus heals a leper, it's in Luke chapter 5. And hopefully it will be on the screen for you. In Luke chapter 5, verse 12 through 13, it says, While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So this man came to Jesus. He comes to Jesus and he falls at Jesus' feet saying, I know you can make me clean. Will you make me clean? Again, hopeless, completely hopeless. But now maybe here's one who can give me some hope. And so he falls on his face. And notice what Jesus does in verse 13. It says, and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean, and immediately the leprosy cleared him, went away from him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine not being touched for who knows how many years? Most of us don't experience that. I'm not one who likes to be touched. But the idea of not being touched at all for who knows, years and years and years, and all of a sudden, Jesus reaches down and touches him. Now, just the act of physical touch is a big deal, but when he touches him, what happens? He's he's healed. He's cured. Which now means he can go touch his kids again. Right? Which now means he can go back to his wife and hug her again. He can live in the home again. Why? Because Jesus touched him and Jesus, Jesus healed him. Just a total life change of hopelessness to all of a sudden everything was back. Everything was back for that man in Luke chapter 5. Now, we don't have the same scenario, though, here in our text today in Luke 17. Because in Luke 17, these men don't come to Jesus. They stand away from him. They do not approach him. And they yell out to him. They yell out to him hoping that Jesus will hear them. And so in our, in our thing here, this, it says that they shout out to him. And that's what it means. They they lifted their voices. They, they are screaming out, 
Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And it makes sense, right? Because this is their only hope. They, they couldn't care less what all the crowds think of them. There's none of that in them at this moment. Because they already know the crowds hate them. These people don't like us. We're untouchable. And so at this moment, it's not even crossing their mind what these other people will think. The only thing that they can think about is there is a man right there who maybe can help me. And for a split second, I have some hope, and I need to get his attention. And so the ten of them do that. They lift their voices loudly, and it says Jesus hears them. But again, Jesus doesn't approach them. Jesus hears them, and he tells them something that's interesting. He says, go, go to the priest and show yourself to the priest. Now, to you and I, this seems very unloving. Because why didn't Jesus say, come here? Right? Come here. We'll, we'll do this now. He doesn't do that. He says, go to the priest. Now, this actually isn't an odd thing because it was, like I said earlier, it was the, it was the priest who would examine to make sure that leprosy was there or that it wasn't there. And so, Kind of what Jesus is doing is he's saying, hey, go show the priest that you're healed now. Because that's what they would have had to do regardless. Even if they were healed, they still by law would have to go to the priest and he has to declare that they were healed. And then they could go back with their families. And so however far that journey was, I don't know, it could have been a long journey at this point. But Jesus is saying, go and, and show the priest yourselves. And so the Bible tells us, that on their way they were healed. Now, I've always been fascinated with this. Uh, I remember thinking about this during like programs and stuff that we used to do. Uh, what did those healings look like? You know what I mean? Like I used to think about that with the kid with the withered leg. Did everybody just like all of a sudden see the muscles come back? Like, boom, there it was. Like CGI style. Was it a, was it a slow process? Like it slowly came in. Did it freak everybody out when they saw that stuff happening? Like could you imagine? Seeing somebody with leprosy just riddled and all of a sudden it starts going away, that had to be kind of panic-stricken. Like, what is happening here? This is, this is odd. And I wonder what it looked like for these ten men. Jesus says, hey, go show yourselves to the priests. And they're willing to do anything. And so they do. They turn and they start to walk. And it just says, all we have is on their way they were healed. I don't know what that looked like. Did all of a sudden one of them say, hey, Something just happened. I don't have leprosy anymore. And the other guys say, well, I do. Maybe if we keep walking, I'll be healed. I don't know. I don't know how it went. I don't know if it happened as soon as they turned. I have no idea. All we know is the Bible tells us that on their way to go see the priest, their bodies were cleansed of leprosy. And then as we get to verses 15 through 19, we get really to the crux of the point of the message this morning. Because as we read verse 15 through 19, we know that all these men were healed. There were 10 healed, but only one of them turns and goes back to Jesus to give thanks for what has happened. He, only one goes back to the person who, who he knows is responsible for the fact that he once was utterly hopeless, but now everything has been given back to him again. And he knows that it's only Jesus who did this. You see, a lot of times when you read this, or even if you listen to sermons on this, you'll hear that only one person was grateful in this story. That that's what we see. That only one person had any sort of gratitude because of what had happened. Now, as I was reading this, and I, I was seeing other people say that, I gotta be honest, I was like, there's no way. There's no way that only one person was thankful. All ten of those men were extremely grateful that they were healed. I can guarantee it. There's no doubt in my mind that they were overjoyed that what had happened to them was a healing, that they were all better. I was thankful to find uh, another commentator who felt the way that I did and said, they absolutely were thankful. All of these guys were happy. Their life had been given back to them. Right? They were, the, probably what happened is they see, I'm healed, and what did they do? They said, let's get to the priest as fast as we can because I'm getting back to my family. I'm getting back to my life. Let's go. And so no doubt, that's what the other nine did. They were heading straight to the priest. Let's get this over with. I've got my life back. I want to get going. They were not ungrateful. 
Instead, they knew what waited for them, just like we talked about earlier. Can you imagine being stripped from your family and never getting to play with your kids again because you have leprosy? And now all of a sudden you're healed? What's the first thing you want to do? I want to get home. Imagine that feeling of the kids running to you and grabbing you by your legs for the first time and hugging you. Look, dad is home. I never thought I'd see dad again. And you thought, I never thought I'd see you again. Of course you would want to get back to that. And so when we look at these nine guys, that's what they were trying to get to. They wanted to get back to their life. Yes, Jesus had healed them, and they were so excited, they wanted to get back to life as normal. Yet there is one guy, the Bible tells us, who before all of that, finds it important to go back to Jesus just to simply thank him for what he had done. Again, I have no doubt. Those nine men knew Jesus did this, and they were glad. But what we have in this story is only one of the men showing it. Only one person was willing to take the time to go back and to recognize their source of joy, their source of hope. And it is this one who Jesus says at the end there, that they had true faith. It was only this one who showed true faith. And what? how do we know this? How, how does Jesus show this? It was because this one is the one who had gratitude, who had thankfulness, which then reminds me again of Romans 1, what we read earlier. They do not thank God. They do not recognize God. They do not recognize his goodness here. You see, when Jesus saves us, it, it should lead us to a gratitude that is expressed to him. Again, I, went, I, I told you about the, the young man or woman in college, right, who we could be frustrated with. They're living this life of, of stress, and you look at them and you're like, what? You have everything, but yet you live so ungratefully, right? We would be, we would be frustrated with that. And then we look at the story of the lepers, and we can understand as we see their life they probably lived the rest of their life with great thankfulness. At least that's what you and I would expect, wouldn't we? Because everything was gone for them, and now everything has been restored to them because Jesus has healed them. And so we would look at them, and, and we wouldn't be shocked to walk in and say, well, of course they're happy, wouldn't we? <laughs> well, of course their life is, is so much better now. Of course it is. Look what God has done for them. You see, as Christians, this is our story. Whenever the Bible talks about leprosy, leprosy is clearly an analogy of sin. That's what it is. I think that's why I've been so fascinated with the stories of the lepers. Just like leprosy, sin makes us unclean, according to God's word. Sin makes us numb to the impact that it really has on us, doesn't it? Where you and I know we still struggle with this even today as Christians who've been saved by God's grace, where we think, you know, this is a little sin. It won't have that much of an impact. That sin's numbing effect on us. We don't realize that all sin equals death. Sin causes death. <laughs> That's what it is. And so we're unclean because of our sin. We're, we, we become numb to our sin, and we know that too if we if we live in sin very long and we don't repent of it and we don't go to God, what happens? It becomes a lot easier to sin, doesn't it? It becomes a lot easier to keep doing this and doing this and doing this and falling into these traps. Because of sin, it causes us to want to be just with other sinners. And we see this in the Psalms as well, right? Psalm 1. We stand, we sit, we like to be with other sinners. And what sin does to us, the Bible tells us, is sin leaves us with no hope whatsoever. And as we study the Word of God, we, we start to realize and we start to see that the Bible does tell us that there is hope for sin. And the hope is found in one person, the man Jesus. Same with the people with leprosy. The only hope that they had was Jesus. And so they called out to him and they cried out to him and Jesus healed them of their leprosy. It's the same with us and our sin, that there's only one man, the God-man, who can heal us of our disease of sin, and that is Christ Jesus. It is only him. 
And we need to call out to him. We need to come to him. And the Bible tells us that when we do this, we will be forgiven, that we will be healed, that we will be restored. He is the only solution for sin for all mankind. That's it. There's no other way. There's no other opportunity. It's only Jesus. And so you can see the parallels here, I think, between leprosy and sin. And so, for those of us who've been saved, if that's you this morning, and I I really hope it is, I, I hope you've trusted in Christ. Before Jesus saved us, before Jesus saved you, before he saved me, we were just like these men. Utterly hopeless. Completely separated from God and dying. Dying. And there was nothing that could help us. No matter... No matter what we would try to do, you know this, because some of you tried it. No matter what you would take, no matter, no matter who you would meet, just, just nothing can help that problem that we have of, of sin. It's only Jesus who can do this. And so Jesus then lets us know who he is, doesn't he? We, we have his word or his preached to us or, or the gospel was shared to us by a friend or a family member and all of a sudden... I hope you remember this if you're a Christian. All of a sudden, it starts to make sense. You start to realize, I am a sinner. And then you can't escape it. You recognize it, but you can't escape it. And then you realize, but the Bible tells me that Jesus came to die for me in my place. And all of a sudden, it starts to work where you think, I think this is about me. And maybe I hope you remember that for the first time you think, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe that you came so that I could be cleansed. You remember that moment? Again, it's not a moment for everybody. That's why I don't, I don't like saying that too much. But do you remember that realization of this promise that Jesus has made that I can be washed free of my sin because of his blood this is for me. I remember for me, even at a young age, being only like seven years old, the weight and the excitement of acceptance. <laughs> even at that young age of saying, Jesus accepts me for me. Now the struggle in my Christian life from the age of seven to now the age of 41 has been to continue to believe that every day. That's been the great struggle, is every day to wake up, or even worse, every night when I go to bed, because I know all the sin that I committed that day, to lay my head down saying, Jesus, I thank you that you died for me. Because there's been plenty of nights, and I think you would agree too, of when I go to bed feeling very dirty, thinking, Jesus, there's no way you could have died for me today. But the promise says, oh, yeah. oh yes, I did. Oh, yes, I did. I've forgiven you. All of your sin. Past, present, and future. And it feels so good to know and to understand that Jesus has saved me, and he's cleansed me, and he's made me whole. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And as I begin to understand that, and as I get to, I picture myself as that leper, and Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest, and I'm cleansed, and I'm I'm completely healed. I'm completely whole. What does that lead to? What should that lead to? It should lead me to be like the one, doesn't it? Like the one who goes back to Jesus and he says, thank you. Thank you. Because I know apart from you, this never could have happened. This this never could be. So I would have to think, again, all of those lepers, all ten of them, For the rest of their life, I would have to think, thought about Jesus often. But only one of them was ever told, you have real faith. You understand what has happened and what has taken place. You see, I think what happens is God blesses us with all kinds of things and our our life gets so clouded with all the other blessings that are great blessings that we should thank God for. They are good things, don't get me wrong. But we start to think that those things are better than the one thing that actually is the most important. And that is the fact that Jesus has cleansed you of your sin. 
There is no greater thing that God can ever give you than Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that he has given us Jesus Christ to us fully and completely. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Nobody can ever separate us from Christ, not even ourselves. We can't do that. God loves us so much, and he's given us that great blessing. And so our lives should be a life of great gratitude towards Jesus, towards him. Our salvation is in Christ, and it can't be taken away. And so our lives, our our thankfulness should always be centered on Jesus, not the other things. Again, the other things are great. It's great to be able to pray to God, isn't it? And say, God, thank you for helping me get over the cold I had. That's a great thing to be able to pray, and we thank God for that. God, we thank you for keeping us safe on our travels, right? Because we pray, God, keep us safe as we're driving, wherever it might be, and we get there safe. And it's good to be able to say, God, thank you for keeping me safe. Maybe some of you remember praying, God, there's got to be somebody who will marry me. Somebody. And then the next thing you know, you're sitting next to them. That is a great blessing. God, thank you for my spouse. A lot of you prayed for children. And you have children. Some of you have grandchildren. Some of you have great-grandchildren. These are fantastic blessings that God has poured out on you. Guys, we could list so many things, couldn't we? But what separates us from the rest of the world? Because the rest of the world, guess what? They have wives. Some of them have multiple wives. My wife makes me watch a show with that. It's awful. Some of them have children. I have lost friends who have grandchildren. Right? What separates the Christian from everybody else isn't those blessings that God gives us because, again, God is so kind, he gives those to even the lost people. Where our gratitude is centered is on the fact that God, through the blood of his son Jesus, has saved you. And he loves you. And you get to call him Father. You see, those still lost in their sin don't have the privilege to go to God and say, Father. But you do. Those people without Jesus look to their blessings, and yes, they can have thanksgiving, and they should be thankful for what they have, but the fact is, They still have leprosy. It's all band-aids. That isn't going to solve any problems. When they die and judgment happens, God's not going to say, how many kids did you have? How many grandkids did you have? How good was your Christmas? That's not what the basis of entry is on. What it is, is are you forgiven? Have you been washed in the blood of my son? And for us as Christians, we can gladly say, yeah. And so when we look at what should our gratitude be centered on, it's on Jesus. And it's always on Jesus. So often the Bible speaks of our thankfulness. And it talks about us voicing praise to God. And I want to read some of them. I only only picked out four of them. Spencer read one in Romans chapter 5 that does it as well. But I want you to notice what our thanks is always centered on. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2 14. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Colossians 3 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Hebrews thirteen fifteen. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. This is who we are to be. 
people of gratitude because of Christ. Because of what he has done. You see, I really, I really do believe this. I, don't, I do believe there's depression. I, I do believe there's anxiety. So don't, don't come up to me after and be mad, please. But I do think one of the reasons we struggle so much with that stuff today is because we do not live a life of gratitude. We do not think and dwell on the things that God has done for us in Christ Jesus enough. And listen, I'm one of those people. I stand before you today as one of those people. There are days that go by and I think, Tim, you have been bitter all day long. What are you so bitter about? And I answer myself and I say, I've been so busy today. I've had no time for anything. I didn't even get to eat lunch today and I'm just tired. That's why I'm bitter today. And then I answer myself again and I say, well, what were you so busy with? Oh, you were busy going to your kid's game. Oh, that stinks, doesn't it? You have kids and they play sports of what you've wanted them to play and you've pushed them to do it. And now you get to go watch them? Oh, poor guy. Oh, you had to go to church today. You had to study. That sermon's hanging heavy on your, on your shoulders, huh? Oh, I wanted that. You see... It, And I start to just get a little depressed inside. But really, I just need to change my thinking a little bit and be thinking about how good God has been to me. The blessings that he's continued to pour out. But again, most of all, I am his and he is mine. Now, please know, I'm not saying you should never go to the doctor because you're depressed or anything. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying that the opposite of depression and anxiety oftentimes is gratitude. And if you're anything like me, you need to do a little better job of thinking and pondering the great things that God has done. This is why it's important for us, I believe, to be in the Word of God every day. Because it reminds us of these things. It's important for us to gather together as church family so that we can hear from other people how God has promised in Christ Jesus to hold us and to secure us. Right? These are the things that we need. I know that I need it, and I'm assuming, because the Word of God tells me, that you need it as well. And so I hope that through this series of looking at God's generosity, how God has been kind to us through Christ, through creation, through our church family, through our regular family, even through our community, I hope that that, what that does is lead us to be people of great gratitude, of great thankfulness. I'm sure you know what it's like to be around people who are very thankful people. They're usually good people to be around. You like being around them because they're, they seem to be happy. They seem to have things in perspective. Well, church family, if there is one people group in our world who should be people of thankfulness and gratitude, is it not us, the church? <laughs> is it not us as Christians who stand on the fact that Christ is the only way and he has saved us? It's us who should be grateful. We ask, how can we get people to come to church? Show some gratitude. (laughs) It's attractive, right? It's what people want. But I know it's a struggle. And so I hope today that as we close here that you'll respond to the word of God by maybe praying and just asking God to help you with that. That's what I have to do often. God, help me to be grateful. God, it's not my natural disposition. So help me to think of those things. Remind me of these good things. Help me to dwell on this. And God, in turn, I pray that other people would see it and be drawn to it so that I can share with them where my gratitude lies. Not in my family, not not in any of these other things. My gratitude is cemented in Jesus Christ, him crucified for me in my place. That's where it is. And then trust that God will work through that. Well, let's bow together. Let's pray. I want to allow you to respond to the word of God as I pray, but then also as we close singing a, a song together. So let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for how kind you are to us, how good you are to us. God, you do bless us with so much. We all know this. We could list it. The list would go on for a very long time. But God, I pray that you would help us to remember that all of our thanksgiving, all of our gratitude is centered on the fact that Jesus Christ has saved us. It is on him. Just like those lepers, they owed everything to Jesus. Without Jesus, they would have stayed untouchable. 
They would have had to stay away from society, and they would have died very lonely deaths. But that when Jesus touched them, when Jesus healed them, when Jesus spoke, and they were cleansed, they were given life again. And God, we have a desire to be like the one who went back to Jesus' feet. Maybe the others would mention that they were happy what Jesus had done for them. Maybe they had even spoken his name to others. I don't know, but God, we see that only one was willing to go back. God, we want to be like that one. Help us to be thankful. Help us to see your generosity, to fall at your feet each and every day, remembering that it's because of you that we are yours. It's because of Jesus that we get to call you Father. And so God, I pray that as we sing this last song that we would dwell on your goodness to us in Christ. And that, of course, yes, that would extend out to all the other blessings that we have. But God, I pray that it would be cemented on Jesus and on Jesus alone. So help us with that now as we sing this song to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.